Welcome to the Small Town Pastors blog. I am Nate Babcock. I'm the preacher at the Buchanan Christian Church in Buchanan, Michigan. I am joined, as always, by Keith Robinson, a preacher at the Cave City. Is it Church of Christ or Christian Church? Christian Church. Cave City Christian Church in Cave City, Kentucky. There is a Cave City Church of Christ. It's down the street. Oh, down the street. Okay. <laughs> So uh, Keith and I are back at it after something of a hiatus, uh, which is entirely my fault. I've been, uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but largely out of town and pretty preoccupied with other things the last month and a half. Uh, but Keith and I are uh, ready to get back to having these conversations with, with each other, which we hope are beneficial uh, to you uh, if you watch along as we discuss church leadership and ministry, we have completed a series of discussions about what we can learn about leadership from the book of Nehemiah. And now we are transitioning to a discussion about eldership. Uh, what does the Bible say about elders? Um, what, what, what are elders? What are their roles and responsibilities? And more besides. So, Keith, I'm going to ask you to get us started on this subject about uh, elders. All right. It's good to be back with you and with everybody again. Uh, so our question, uh, and we'll be working on this as sort of our, our next second series. We've gone through the book of Nehemiah. Now we're going to talk about elders and other leaders in the church for a while. Um, today, I want to talk about, or we want to talk about uh, definitions, terminology, uh, roles, uh, qualifications, sort of just the, the basic uh, foundation of what makes an elder, who is an elder, what do they do, that kind of stuff. And then in a future episode, uh, we'll start going into some of the more nuanced details of what does that look like in specific situations, what are some of the do's and don'ts of eldership, and all that good stuff. To me, I think before we get into um, too much of the conversation, we need to uh, define a few terms and we need to know a little bit about the background of what we are talking about, or else we'll end up, you know, one person will be thinking one thing, one person will be thinking a different thing, uh, and they'll never actually meet in the middle. So my first sort of caveat is, is that how we envision church government or what methods we are most familiar with, what methods we grew up with, what methods we currently use, all of that is inevitably going to affect how we answer this question of what is an elder. So we first kind of have to determine how we are going to answer the question um, before we give an answer to the question. Now, if you're not very, oh, God. So maybe Keith, we should just take a second and explain where we're coming from, right? Mm -hmm. What our kind of location is in the church government map and yeah. all that. For sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of different options. Uh, if you're not overly familiar with this topic or this um, type of conversation, um, between different denominational groups, different other Christian groups uh, of how their churches are run. Uh, so one of the more popular ones is the idea of a sort of a hierarchy. And the technical term for this would be sort of an Episcopal uh, style of church. And we see this in you know, Catholic Church and Methodist, United Methodist Church. We see this in Lutheran Church, a lot of different uh, denominations use this, where uh, you have your, your local congregation, that would be the church that you attend, uh, and that church has some leadership, and maybe some of that was uh, nominated by the people there, but maybe some of it also was appointed by uh, a group that's higher up. There'll be somebody that oversees 10, 15, 20, 100 congregations, and then there's a group above them that oversees the whole entire thing. Uh, and you know, just as in like our political government model where, you know, you have the national level, the state level, the local level, and, you know, the lower levels uh, have to answer to the higher levels. So too, in these churches, you know, the lower congregations have to answer to their higher ups. And, and those people have a, a very high degree of influence uh, over what goes on in the congregation. At some point in the future, we'll talk probably more in depth about and what happens in the Christian Church, Church of Christ Restoration Movement. Um, but as a, a simple uh, introduction, our movement got its start by taking a look at that model and saying, we don't really need this. 
Now, there's not necessarily scriptural support for having all these levels of leadership. Uh, it's certainly not always most advantageous for people in the local congregations, especially 200 years ago, uh, when it's very difficult to communicate from long distances. You know, you have somebody 500 miles away making a decision for you, uh, and you've never met that person. Uh, and so a number of different, um, actually leaders at different levels, uh, came together and said, let's just kind of step away from all of that. Uh, and when we have our congregations, let's make them autonomous, make them uh, individual from one another. That doesn't mean that we don't cooperate or that we don't communicate, uh, but that when it comes to making decisions for our congregation, uh, we're going to leave that up to the people in that congregation. Uh, and so for the Christian church, for the Church of Christ, uh, elders and other lay leaders are done just within the congregation. And so even though Nate and I are both from the Christian church, pastors of the Christian church, you know, there's nobody that oversees our two congregations. And you know, I don't really have- Outside of the congregation. Outside of the congregation itself, yeah. Uh, and then I can't really influence or impact what you're doing, uh, nor can you influence or impact what I'm doing. Not in any authoritative way. Correct. Yeah. And so- yeah, Keith and I are both in, you know, independent Christian churches, churches of Christ, which are autonomous, meaning each congregation runs itself, so to speak, and is not answerable to any higher level of authority. And our congregations in the Christian churches, the churches of Christ, are elder-led. Yes. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have this discussion, because in our circles, so to speak, elders are quite important, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they have a, a primary role in the life of, of the church. And uh, we do believe that's we do believe that's biblical, and so what that's we want to take a close look at, the, at what the scriptures say. Uh, but we just I think it's helpful at the outset for us to identify in ministry, and you know this is where we're at, and this is our experience, this is where we're coming from, this is our perspective as we talk about this issue as we both function in ministry in elder-led congregations. Right. So that was a, that was an interjection, Keith. But go ahead and take us on to on to the plan now of, of the the background of the New Testament terminology. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll throw one more little thing in there. If you are watching this and you are not from uh, the Church of Christ Christian Church, we still are are glad to have you joining us for this conversation. And I think uh, it'll still be a beneficial conversation uh, for you to listen in and participate. in. Um, not everything we say may be immediately applicable to your environments if you are from a, a denominational church or obviously if you're not from a, a church period. Um, but I think this is, a, as Nate said, this is an important conversation to have. And I think it'll be a beneficial one uh, for you to be involved with, even if you are not from the specific background that we are. And most churches have elders, or even if they don't use that terminology, people who function mm -hmm. in something like that role, right? So. Yeah, so when we look at terminology, um, this is another one of those things where, you know, our background is going to affect what we think these words mean. Um, but there's a, a number of different descriptions or titles uh, found in the New Testament. Um, elder, obviously, um, bishop, overseer, pastor, shepherd. Uh, and again, depending on your background, uh, each of these is a different office. Uh, each of these is a different title, or they're all synonymous with one another. Uh, so, Nate, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and just ask, okay. what, what is your thought on some of these different ideas? What do they mean? Uh, who are they? You know, all that kind of fun stuff. Okay. Well, um, I, I will say that as I read the, the, the New Testament, I think that at least the terms elder and overseer or which is sometimes translated as bishop i think those two terms are more or less i don't know synonymous is the right word i think they're used to refer to the same group of people mm -hmm. right i think that so the the greek word that's translated elder or elders is presbyteros and uh when paul in Titus chapter one gives qualifications for local church leaders. He, he talks about elders, presbyteros, right? However, in first Timothy chapter three, 
and he gives a very similar list of qualifications for church leaders. Uh, he doesn't use the term elder, he uses the term episcopos, which we translate as overseer or bishop. Right? And, but those, those qualifications and responsibilities outlined in those passages, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, are very similar. And then when you go to Acts chapter 20, where Paul uh, is meeting with the elders of the Ephesian church at Miletus, uh, before Paul goes back to Jerusalem, um, he addresses them and uh, at, the, at the beginning of that, that passage in Acts 20, um, it says that Paul called for the elders of, of, you know, of the church in Ephesus, but then when he addresses them and he, he, he gives them some instruction uh, for their ongoing work of leading the church in Ephesus after his departure, um, you know, he, he says that the Holy Spirit has made them overseers, episcopos, right, of, of the church, and he tells them to care for or shepherd, and the, 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 the verb is, uh, you know, poimano, right, to shepherd, to care for or to shepherd the flock of God under their care. And so in that passage in Acts 20, um, overseers and uh, elders, those two terms appear to be used interchangeably to refer to the same group of people. Uh, and, but the addition of that verb for shepherding thrown in there. Uh, so I think the New Testament evidence points in the direction of these are not separate offices or roles of leadership, but the same, they're used to refer to the same group of people. Uh, people who are entrusted with the leadership of the local congregation. Um, and there are shades of meaning, and we'll talk about this. There are shades of meaning to each. They don't mean exactly the same thing. And each of them helps, each of those meanings helps to bring out a different kind of aspect of the leadership role that is entrusted to those people. Um, but that's how I read it. it what, 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 do you, what do you think, Keith? I'm very much of the same opinion. Um, and as you said, we'll dive into some of the concrete definitions here in just a second. Um, but yeah, in, in my opinion, when we look through the New Testament, um, I think what we first have to understand is the New Testament is based upon the Old Testament. Uh, and that you know, all of these people, when we're looking at the very beginnings, the foundations of the early church, are coming from that uh, Jewish historical background. Yeah. And you know, when we look at the way the Old Testament does things and we look at the way and the Jewish people for hundreds of years prior to this did things, you know, they didn't have all of these different offices. And they had a very similar setup where you know, there's one specific group of people, the elders, um, and they may get referred to different, uh, get referred to as different things or by different ways, uh, depending on what nuance is needed. Uh, and so you might sometimes call them the teachers or you might call them the experts in the law or you might call them you know just the elders at the gate or you you, know, you might do something very similar uh, but it's still the same group of people you're just emphasizing a different aspect of what they do uh, by using a different term so the jews had elders as community leaders right and had had that for a long long time mm -hmm. so that comes very naturally out of Jewish tradition and Judaism into Christianity, yes, because all of the first Christians were Jews, right? So they brought that that leadership model with them. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when we look at, uh, I'm gonna kind of read through this, kind of stop and things of like that, and feel free to interject at any time. Make okay. so as we just said, uh, pretty much everybody in the early church either was Jewish, grew up Jewish, or we're very familiar with a, a Jewish context. And when we look at the writers of the New Testament, uh, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews for sure. All of the ones we do know of as authors, only one of them is not Jewish. That would be Luke. And everybody else, Matthew, Mark, John, Paul, Jude, James, you know, they're all Jewish. Uh, and you know, when we look at the early church itself, it starts in the city of Jerusalem, spreads into Judea, Samaria, Galilee. Uh, all of which are Jewish, or if not Jewish, you know, very, very much closely associated with Jewish um, history, Jewish people. And, right. so, and so it makes a good deal of sense that that is the model they are going to lean on 
as they figure out you know, what they're going to do. And most of the way the church is structured um, in the New Testament is based upon um, the Jewish community, is based upon the Jewish family. Um, so those terms get used, uh, those roles get used. Um, and so it's not unreasonable to assume that many of these models, definitions and stuff are just coming from that Jewish perspective as a starting point. Um, in the Old Testament, the word elder is zakein. Uh, it's referred, it refers to someone who is, well, old, you know, <laughs> the name elder, yeah. Yeah. Um, but also more specifically, somebody who is a, a community leader. And um, most of the time these are, look, we're looking at a town or a village uh, versus any sort of, you know, religious structure, but those two were very much intertwined with one another. Yes, very much. Uh, so it's, yes. it's kind of hard to separate the two. Um, and the, these individuals would be uh, viewed as uh, men who are worthy of honor and respect because of their age and what that represents, you know, their, their history of work, the knowledge or the wisdom that they have accrued over time. Um, their experience, their their past leadership roles, now all of this stuff is sort of balled up and so, and they would say, well, because you have reached that point of maturity, uh, you are worthy of being respected and therefore we should listen to what you have to say. Right. So in Old Testament times, these people, these men would, they're, in, they're all men. So um, that's just the way their society was structured. Yeah. Uh, they would often gather at uh, the gates of the, the town or the village or, or whatnot um, to do a number of different things. Their role um, were, was to handle legal transactions. Uh, we see this with the story of Ruth and Boaz. Now, when Boaz wants to marry Ruth, um, because of her situation being the widow of a, a Jewish man, um, she's technically supposed to go to whoever the closest living male relative of her deceased husband is, and there is somebody that is a closer relative than Boaz, and you don't need to know all these details, but um, simplistically put, there's a, a legal issue in, in how that relationship's gonna work. And so Boaz goes to the men at the gates and, and the elders at the gates and, and asks them uh, to handle this dispute. And the other guy comes in and, and he decides he doesn't wanna marry Ruth and it gets resolved. Uh, but that's- Town where, gate being the place where community business is handled. Yeah. and and the elders are either seated or they gather there, right? When when something needs to be addressed or a decision needs to be made. Yeah. yeah kind of the town hall, so to speak. Yeah. 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 They're, they're legal advisors. They are sort of political leaders in that respect. They also sometimes serve as, we would think of it like a judge handling a, a court case or, you know, some sort of problem that has come up in the community. Uh, and this happens, this is actually outlined in the book of Deuteronomy as one of their roles. Um, they would handle governmental affairs. Uh, we see this in Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, as they're restarting their community, how all that goes. And we talked about this a little bit when we we're going through the book of Nehemiah, uh, the times when Nehemiah would interact with the other leaders of the city of Jerusalem um, and either ask them to step up and do their role or you know, get their input, disseminating the information and so on. And of course, they also led in religious activities. They were the elders of both the, the political sphere and the religious sphere. Um, so some of the first elders uh, to be chosen for the Jewish people uh, occurred during the Exodus, uh, when uh, they are wandering under the leadership of Moses, uh, co-leading, and the people, because the burden was too great for him alone. And when we look at the Exodus story, this is actually a suggestion from Moses's father-in-law originally, because um, Moses is sitting in his tent day and night handling court cases and decisions and things. And uh, Jethro comes up and says, you know, this is too much for you to handle alone. You know, appoint some people that uh, are qualified and capable to handle some of the lesser things for you. And if they run into problems, they can bring that to you instead. And so that's what they do. Uh, they sort of divide everybody up um, by like thousands and hundreds and tens and um, put people in charge. 
Uh, and then that sort of works itself out later as being the tribal leaders uh, when uh, they start wandering for 40 years and then when they get ready to enter the land of Canaan, uh, where there is a, a group of individuals who oversee their entire tribe, uh, which then once they settle down becomes these community leaders that we've been talking about. I was just looking back at some of these passages, Keith, that you're referring to. It's in Exodus 18, mm -hmm. where Jethro comes to Moses with this suggestion, hey, you need to lighten the load a little bit here, spread it, spread it out, spread the spread the workload out, and then appoint these leaders. And then the, the passage that immediately came to my mind, because I've been thinking about this passage for an entirely different reason, is in Numbers 11, mm -hmm. where uh, Moses People are, you know, they're complaining again, bitterly complaining about their situation. And Moses gets just overwhelmed. And he basically says to God, why are you treating me like this? Why did you stick me with these people? And if you're going to keep treating me like this, just kill me, right? Mm -hmm. It's better off for me to be dead than have to deal with these people. Anymore. So it's like, he's like, a, like just a despair point in his life, you know, over having to deal with them. And, and the Lord... Numbers eleven sixteen. 16, the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tent of meeting. And so the Lord proceeds to do something similar, right? To basically call these men to share the burden of the leadership of Israel with Moses. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, this actually wasn't in my notes, but I think it's worthwhile bringing it out. Um, when, we, when we ask the question, why? Uh, why do we have elders? Why do we need to have this conversation? That right there is the answer. The, there's too much, even in a, a small congregation, for one individual to handle completely alone. Or even if that individual is capable, uh, it's maybe not necessarily wise to rest all of that upon one individual and say, well, you're going to do everything and it's always going to be your way no matter what uh, and so the reason for having a plurality of elders and, and you know dispersing that is so that it can fall upon multiple people instead of one and, and we can use the the talents or the gifts of these various individuals to answer an issue that uh, one person alone may not be capable of doing yes that concept and it's very present in the Old Testament, and I think very clear in the New Testament of shared plural leadership among a group of, of men um, is precisely what you've said, Keith, that too much responsibility and burden for one person uh, and the, the, the work of caring for and leading, shepherding, equipping God's people is better done by a group of people, a group of men who bring together a set of gifts and abilities and experiences that complement and supplement one another because we all have our strengths and weaknesses. Right. Um, and, and so, yeah, very much so. It just makes, it's just wise, right? It just makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say from the- I don't think so. I think that, I think that pretty well establishes the some of the old testament background okay. so when we move into the new testament um, this is another just sort of little caveat before we go further is that i think it's important to note the new testament often tells us what happened as it was happening uh, rather than trying to give us some sort of formal instruction manual of how to do things uh, because of the early church's formation being situational being you know in local places as it's occurring and then just sort of a description of what's happening there or instructions for those specific situations not every church is formed the same way uh, and we don't have just you know all right let's go here and this is going to lay everything out uh, exactly the way we need it to uh, yeah this is an area i'm glad you said that keith when i looked at your notes for this episode i was glad that you made that point um and this is a little bit of a kind of a hermeneutical detour, I guess, but I think one of the areas where um, we've had some problems in the Christian churches and churches of Christ is with our hermeneutic mm -hmm. and approaching the Bible and the New Testament in particular as some kind of once and for all established pattern 
yeah. or you know the 19th century language was constitution you know uh, uh and 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 looking to the bible as though it is more prescriptive uh than it actually is in some of these situations right like you say there's a lot of description telling us what happened as it happened not as much prescription like this is the way you should or must do it mm -hmm. uh as as we would like and sometimes we've gotten in trouble reading historical descriptions as though they're meant to set forth a pattern that must be copied in all times and situations right, right? i just think that's that's just poor biblical interpretation right. uh, yeah and so if you're if you're listening to this and you're not sure what we're talking about um it Probably the easier example of this is what we do with some of the Old Testament stories. So, for example, you know, you look at the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and so on, and you know, they have multiple wives. Now, let's use that as as an example. You know, and each one of them does. They have multiple wives, or they take their wives' handmaidens as concubines, and you know, they have children from these various people, uh, and what we are given is a description. You know, this is what's happening. Um, we're not necessarily told that this is a good thing to do or that this is what we should do, uh, just that that is what happens. Now, some people look at that and say, well, the Bible contradicts itself um, because it talks about how you should only have one wife. You should be you know, faithful to that one individual for all time, but all of these, you know, leaders Heroes of the faith yeah uh had had multiple ones. so you know it's contradicting itself and no it's not it's uh, when we're reading those stories we're just being told this is you know what they did well it's not endorsing that it's just a description of what happened and then right. once we get to the actual prescriptive text it says don't do that just have one life right and when we learn to read and biblical narratives closely, you will often pick up on some clues in those texts where there is some criticism of those kinds of practices going on, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that the author isn't super overt. Uh, and like you say, he's not endorsing, but often there is a kind of at least implicit criticism of uh, the, 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 problems right with it with an approach to marriage like that and so the, i think keith's point is we don't we shouldn't read the old testament narratives about the patriarchs or for that matter david and solomon being polygamous as endorsing polygamy right that's not the point of those narratives right and while i think there is something to the idea that the book of acts is does have something of a quality of setting kind of an example to follow in some respects, right, for the church. I do think there's something to that. I think often we've also overdone that, mm -hmm. right, to turn what is a narrative into some kind of binding law, um, which which is just overreading the text, right, and asking something of it that it's not meant to give us. Uh, yeah. So uh, a New Testament example of this would be you know, when we'll read through Paul's letters, um, they are initially letters sent to individual congregations. You know, the book of Romans is sent to the church in Rome. The book of First Corinthians is the first letter that's sent to the church in Corinth, and on down the line we go. Um, and so, you know, we could do the same mistake with some of the stuff in there. Um, one example would be like in Philippians, Paul says, I urge, uh, what is it? Utica, Uticus and Syndicate to stop arguing with one another and to resolve their quarrels. Well, obviously this is a, a prescription. So if we have two ladies in our church and these are their names, then you know, we need to intervene in whatever quarrel they have. I don't think that's what Paul is saying. He's you know, fixing an issue that's happening there in the church in Philippi. And us coming 2000 years later can say, all right, you know, that is a good idea. If we have conflict in the church, we should resolve itself. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to do it specifically the way that's being described there for that specific individual action. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the and so the point is is we're just coming into these New Testament passages about elders. You know, some of them are 
prescriptive, what elders, what kind of people elders should be, and what are some of the things they should do. And these are classically the first Timothy 3, the Titus chapter 1, the first Peter chapter 5 texts, as well as some of what Paul says in Acts chapter 20, which we've already referred to. But then a lot of what we see or learn about elders is also descriptive, right? It's a narrative of, uh, you know, what elders did. And a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it is found in the book of Acts. Um, and it's not that those passages don't have value for us. It's just that we need to be sure that we're approaching them the right way. Okay. So uh, getting back on track a little bit, uh, the when we look at how did elders come to be in the church. Um, as near as we can tell, the church in Jerusalem had uh, the apostles, obviously, from the very start, uh, and then that sort of worked its way into eldership being something directly given by the apostles, or the apostles are effectively elders for a while until they you know, transition into I don't think it really tells us, does it, how the elders were appointed or established in Jerusalem? No, in just the Jerusalem have... church. I mean, by the time we get to Acts 15, there are apostles and elders yeah. in the Jerusalem church, but I'm not sure that it comes right out and says. Uh, where did the elders come from? Right, where did they come from? Right. They just dropped that out of the sky from heaven or something? Or, right. right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so what, what we do get in the book of Acts is you know, we get the, the conversation in Acts 1 and 2 of, uh, you know, now that Judas Iscariot is gone, how do we replace him as one of the 12 apostles, uh, which they do by casting lots. Um, we get uh, the birth of the- that. We should use that method today. Keith. We should. Right, That's, I mean, this is a good example, right? Well, they cast lots for who was gonna replace Judas, so why don't we cast lots today? <laughs> All right, we're, how, who's gonna be our next preacher? <laughs> <All right. laughs> I have a feeling somebody out there does do that. I imagine that's probably the case, yeah. Yeah, they, they cast lots to replace um, Judas. Uh, we get the birth of the church itself in Acts 2, uh, the Holy Spirit falling down on fire, the you know, thousands of people that come forward to be immersed. Um, we get in Acts chapter 6, sort of a conversation about leadership. Uh, and most people take the approach that in Acts 6, this is the formation of deaconship. Um, where there are seven men who are chosen by the congregation and appointed to oversee the distribution of food uh, between the Greek and Hebrew speaking widows. That's the initial complaint uh, that the various groups are being treated unfairly. And so the. So what's interesting there is that it's that, if that's the case, if that's the historical uh, origin of the, the, the office or role of deacon in the church, it's interesting that. that that arose in response to a need, right. right? Somewhat similar to Moses' need, right? With the people of Israel during the Exodus, right? Too much work for him to do. He needed to spread that work out. Right. And the apostles say, we can't divert our attention from the word of God, preaching the gospel and prayer mm -hmm. in order to meet this need that these widows, they're not, they're not saying that it's an illegitimate need. They're just saying, we can't do that work. We need, we need to appoint some others for that. And they entrust the, they do entrust the Jerusalem congregation with selecting those men, mm -hmm. you know, known to be full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the other thing I've always found interesting about this, this is not related to our topic, but uh, the other thing I've always found interested about that um, passage is, I said, the, the tradition is that's the, the creation of the office of deacon and that these seven men are chosen to be the very first deacons in the church. And that's based primarily on the fact that even though the title is not used, the verb form uh, of diakonia is used in that passage. And so um, the assumption is that's what they're doing, but we never actually see any of those seven men operating that test. Uh, we see Philip is you know, preaching and he becomes an evangelist. We see yes. Stephen who is preaching and teaching and then gets put on trial. Uh, but we never actually see them do the job of the deacon. Waiting tables, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's interesting. Um, so Acts, Acts 1, Acts 2, Acts 6. Um, and then by the time we get to Acts 15, as you said, there are elders in the church who are introduced to James, the half-brother of Jesus, being sort of the head elder of the congregation. 
But yeah, yeah. We're, we're never really told how he received that position. Or even how he came to, uh, because he appears to be, he becomes quite prominent mm -hmm. right, in the Jerusalem church and really has a leadership role in the, mm -hmm. the Jerusalem council in Acts 15. But we're never, we're never told even how James came around to believing that his half-brother is Lord and Savior, right? Because in the Gospels, uh, you know, Jesus' brothers and his family kind of think he's out of his mind. And none of them followed him while Jesus was alive. So yeah, we we, we get gaps in, in the story, things that we don't yeah. need to know, so we're not told. Uh, I think the only I think the only answer we get for that one is is in First Corinthians, where Paul's giving the list of people yes. who saw Jesus after he resurrected, and yeah. James is listed there. And yes. so the assumption is, well, Jesus appeared to James after he resurrected. And so that, that changed his mind. Yeah, right. But, but even yeah. that is, is just an assumption that yes. that's what happened. Yes. So we see in Jerusalem, they eventually got elders. We don't know how. And then in Ephesus and Crete, which is where Timothy and Titus are, when Paul writes the letters to Timothy and Titus, um, the congregations already exist have existed presumably for some length of time. Uh, and one of the roles that Timothy and Titus uh, are meant to do is to find and appoint elders while they are serving there in those uh, congregations. They're coming in sort of as sort of as pastors, sort of as missionary apostles, missionaries, you know, they're um, it's a, a rather unique role that Timothy and Titus have uh, right. in establishing and building up congregations and Ephesus and Greece. But one of their roles is to um, find and select and appoint or whatever elders. Uh, and there is that example in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 14, right, where Paul and I think Barnabas go back through all of the places where they preach the gospel and uh, establish churches and they appoint elders for them yeah. in every location. I think that's Acts 14, 23, I think. Um, and so uh, Paul and Barnabas recognize that these infant churches, newly established churches, need leadership. And both in the book of Acts and also in Timothy and Titus, the model that they turn to is the model that they're familiar with from their Jewish heritage, right, is appointing elders to be leaders of the local community. Right. So when we look at terminology, and we've talked about this a little bit already, uh, but there are two main words in the New Testament uh, that get translated um, into words that we would be using for this conversation, presbyteros and episkopos. Um, normally, presbyteros is translated as elder, and episkopos is translated as overseer or perhaps bishop. Um, there's a couple of different ideas there. When we look at um, presbyteros, elder, uh, this um, because, again, it's based largely upon the Jewish context and history, um, it's pretty much the same as Zakim. It can refer to somebody who is old or who is older. Um, it often connotes or denotes um, officials or leaders. Uh, and so we see this being the term used of the members of the Sanhedrin, the High Jewish Council. Uh, it is used to refer to leaders in the synagogues. Um, which sometimes that, that would be the teachers, but often this would be you know, all of the other uh, leaders within the synagogue. Uh, it can be used to refer to leaders in a town. Uh, again, the idea of meeting at the gates, handling business affairs, political affairs, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, elders in the church. I think we've already talked about all of the references I have listed here, but Acts 15, Acts 20, 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 5, Titus 1. Uh, Ephesians 4, I don't know if we mentioned, but um, that's a very similar um, setting where it's just, so, and then 1 Peter 5. Yeah. So that's, that's elder, presbyteros, uh, older person, person in leadership, an official in some different kind of capacity. And as you said, Keith, the significance of age had to do with maturity and wisdom. Yeah. And respect earned, right? That, and that's the significance of it. Yeah, it's not you know, you're you, you've reached the you know, age cutoff, so now you're you're 
qualified and capable. There, there's more to it than just being old, yeah. but everything that comes with that age. There was kind of a built-in assumption that it, it would come with, and I'm sure that the Jewish people recognized those cases when it didn't, right? They, yeah. They really were older men that didn't make the cut, so to speak, right, to serve as an elder because they did not, had not accumulated that wisdom and that earned respect. Right. Or there was something that would disqualify that. You know, we, so, you know, we see older men that are beggars or that have health conditions or that, you know, they're they, unclean. Yeah. And so those older people are not part of the eldership of the town or the synagogue because yeah. uh, there's something that prevents them from you know, being there, even though they meet the age cut off. Right. So then Episcopos. Yeah, so this yeah. one, overseer, bishop, uh, it's a much rarer word. Um, I have that it's found in Acts 20, 28, Philippians 1, 1, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 2, 25, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's, yeah, not used too much. Yeah, so it's... And the verb is there a few times, right, yeah. to, to oversee, yeah. Yeah, uh, but yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty rare word. Uh, it's similar in scope to the idea of a shepherd, uh, more than anything else, uh, but a shepherd of people uh, rather than actual sheep. Uh, and this is the need to watch over, to care for, uh, to visit the people. You know, one verb, uh, cognate, is translated as simply to visit. Um, but if you, you if you picture what a shepherd does as far as tending to the sheep, leading them where they need to go, getting them out of trouble, you know, healing their wounds, all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's that image applied to people uh, of overseeing them, leading them, care for them, tending to them, uh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that, this word brings out that, that caring for, looking over, supervising aspects of the leadership role that the term elder in and of itself doesn't so much, right? Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at the term elder, that idea is more of a, a decision maker I would, mm -hmm. than anything else. Their, their role is to, or their emphasis is to handle cases that come up to you know, be the ones making the political decisions or the religious decision. So that, that idea of caring for the people they're making decisions for uh, is not necessarily brought out in the definition of elder right. the way it is for overseer. Right. So as we said, um, both terms, we're, we're given a description more than a definition uh, when we look at them. And the texts that talk about them emphasize what these people should do or who they should be um, more than trying to give us a, a rote formula to use. Uh, but it is clear, I think, that the Bible pictures elders, plural, uh, as yes. being, being those who watch over and care for the church because of their unique ability and position to do so. Yes. Do you have anything you want to add before we go on to part two of this little conversation? I don't think so. I, you know, um, yeah, I don't. There's a part of me that wants to diatribe a little bit about solo leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And why that's not a wise or biblical model. Um, but this probably isn't the time or place for that. It just, it is clear that the New Testament envisions plural leadership, shared leadership yeah. of congregations. Right. There's just no other, there's no other description or prescription, right? right. There, in, in the New Testament. Yeah. And we see that even with the people that are very remarkably gifted or supernaturally gifted for their leadership roles. Um, Paul is the one that I use as an example for this quite a bit. And Paul is a very dynamic person. And he does a remarkable amount for the church. He's a, the foremost missionary. He writes half of the New Testament. Uh, but we never see Paul acting by himself. Every time we see him, he has a laundry list of people who are working alongside Luke, Timothy, Titus, Silas, Epaphroditus, Mark, yeah. 
that all of these individuals who are helping Paul in his ministry, who are being sent by Paul to minister in other places, who are ministering to Paul while he is doing his ministry. You know, Paul is, I think the closest he ever gets to being alone is in 2 Timothy, when he's near the end of his life, he, he writes to Timothy that everybody has deserted him except Luke. Luke is still there, but everybody else has run away out of fear, obligation elsewhere. And so he's encouraging Timothy to come to him and to pick up Mark so that Mark can come with him as well. So that there'll be four of them instead of two. But we never really see Paul trying to operate by himself. Right. He's not he's not a solo maverick or anything like that. And in, the, in terms of the foundations of team leadership in the New Testament, you could go back even further to, of course, Jesus calling a large group of disciples, but out of that group of disciples, formally appointing 12 as apostles, right? Yeah. And a trust and trusting them with the you know, foundational work of, of, of starting and leading the church. And again, that's a shared responsibility among those 12 men, right? And then from them, that responsibility is distributed out to elders and deacons and evangelists uh, you know, and teachers, right? It, it, as, as Keith has said, as it unfolds in the New Testament and as we're given the description of its unfolding. Right? So every, every example and teaching prescription that we have in the New Testament points in the direction of plural shared leadership. I think that answer is the question of what is the definition uh, of an elder in scripture. Mm -hmm. The second question is what should an elder do in the church? Uh, and my caveat here, uh, similar to what we said last earlier, is that how we define the term elder is going to affect what we think an elder should do in the church. Uh, and the example I, I'm going to give here is that if we believe elders are the people who govern an entire denomination, uh, which you know several different denominations are set up that way, their elders are not at the local level, they're at the regional or, or higher up level, um, then we're going to have a very different set of expectations or a, a very different job description compared to someone who believes that elders are the leaders of a local congregation and only a local congregation. Right. So we've given you our definition of what is an elder, and that is very much going to color the, the job description that we give yes. for elders. Yes. So once again, just to make it clear, we understand the Bible to teach that elders are the group of men entrusted with the leadership of the local congregation. Yes. So I don't think, you know, again, I'm going to repeat myself for ourselves here a bit. And we're not given a, an actual job description uh, of eldership. We're going to have to piece it together. Yeah, we're, we're given descriptions of, you know, these guys did this here, these guys did this here. Um, and then you know, we're going to take all of that and say, all right, what do the elders of a, a church do um, based upon all of these different passages? And what I have here, and this is not original to me, uh, a lot of the notes that I'm using actually come from a professor of mine, Dr. Eric Stevens, and his notes uh, on church leadership. Um, but he sees um, four different unique or important roles uh, for elders in the church. Uh, so I think the easiest thing here to do is I'll just read the little description that I have and then we yes. can talk about them. Yes. So, so the first is to be a leader. The elder is that set an example for others to follow, uh, is worthy of honor and should imitate Christ, uh, and then therefore should give direction to those who are in their care. Yes. Uh, and then I have well, a variety of passages here, and I'll just throw them out there. And if you're watching at home, you're welcome to look them up. And that would be 1 Peter 5, 3, Hebrews 13, verses 7 and 17. 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, as well as 1 Timothy 5, 17, and Romans 12, 8, uh, all of which kind of cover this idea of elders in the church serving as the leaders of the church, kind of setting an example, giving direction, that kind of stuff. Right. And I do think it's important for us to, I guess, qualify the idea of leadership in the way that the New Testament does, right? 
uh, because it's a very different conception than the world's conception of leadership. Leadership is leadership by example, as you've already said, Keith. It's servant leadership. Um, what Jesus said to his disciples, Mark chapter 10, when James and John came to him wanting to claim the places of right and left at his hand in the, the kingdom they thought was coming, right? And Jesus said, you've got it all wrong. It's not about achieving greater positions of power. It's about descending to, to ever greater levels of service to others. You know, um, And so it's not that eldership doesn't have an element of authority and decision making. It does. It does have that. But the way in which that authority and decision making is exercised, the purposes for which it is exercised, the way in which those men entrusted with that authority and decision making responsibility think of it and hold it, um, all has to be radically conditioned and directed by the example of Jesus himself and by everything else that the New Testament has to say um, about, about, about leadership, that it is by example, it is servant, it is sacrificial, it is love-oriented and focused. It is not, as Peter says in his instruction to elders in First Peter chapter 5, it is not domineering, right? It's not about just having, it's not about control and um, exercising that control so that in, in order to get other people to do what you want them to do. That, that's just a worldly mindset that often gets brought to the church and into eldership. It's often a problem in eldership uh, that we think of leadership that way. So, yeah. I think the image that, that works well for this is if you're, if you want to go somewhere, you know, you're trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B, you can direct someone there by sitting at point A and say, all right, well, you need to go five miles and then turn left and then go another three miles and turn right and so forth. Or you can lead the person there by going first ahead of them and letting them follow you as you get from point A to point B. Uh, yeah, come follow me. Yeah. yeah. And, and very much you know, the biblical yeah. description of leadership is to lead from point A to point B um, those who are following after you, not sitting in your chair and directing them. Right. Yeah. Right. This is this is how I've come to really like to think of um, if if the husband slash father has a leadership role in the home. Uh, the way I like to think of it, and this isn't original original to me, it's, it comes out of some research I did in Ephesians five. But okay, husband slash father, you want to lead, go ahead and lead the way in Christ like love, right? In service and sacrifice. Just go ahead and lead, lead by example, right? That's what it's about, far more than it's about authority, control, or decision making. It's about leading by example mm -hmm. in the way of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So that other people can follow. That kind of leads into the, the second aspect uh, of what an elder should do, and that is to be a shepherd. Um, and you know, as we said earlier, the elder then should watch over. Um, the flock, the church, those who are in their care, uh, they should do their best to provide for the needs of those individuals and, and, again, show them where to go or how to get to what they need. Uh, and the scripture references for this is Ephesians 4.11, James 5.12, and 1 Peter 5.2. The idea that elders should be shepherds uh, within the congregation. Yeah, and that's what Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, and I think that, that Peter says something very similar in 1 Peter chapter 5, mm -hmm. shepherd the flock, care for the flock, and you've already referred to this once, keep once, keep, but it's about what shepherds do, they feed, mm -hmm. they guide or lead, they protect, right? they bind up or, or heal, right, when a sheep is, the lamb is wounded, right? You can think of what Jesus says in like Luke 15, they'll go in search of the of, of, of the, the sheep that is lost, right? Or that has wandered away. Mm -hmm. right? So all of the, and all of this really they'll visit, right? It, it, you know, it really emphasizes these caring, nourishing, protecting functions of the elders, right? Uh, this this image does. Um, and uh, oh, 
I was just thinking of something that really went well with this, but I can't remember what it is. So I'll pass to you, Keith. But yeah, yeah, Shepard. Yeah. The thing that came to my mind, and I don't have this on my notes, it just sort of popped in, is you know it's very interesting to me that Peter uh, gives elders instructions to shepherd the flock. Because that's one of the last mm-hmm. conversations he had with Jesus. They're sitting on the bank yeah. of the river or the, the lake eating fish. And then three times and Jesus asks, Peter, do you love me? And you know, there's this nuance there that we lose in English because we translate both agape and phileo as the word love, where they mean two different things in Greek. Um, but basically, you know, Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Are you going to... Uh, what is always spiritually best and the first two times Peter says well you know I I love you like a friend you're you're a nice guy uh, I care about you type thing oh, yeah. and, and each time Jesus says tend my feet feed my lambs and take care of my flock and, and so Peter eventually gets psalm and says all right yes I love you unconditionally I will always do what is is spiritually best for you and for your people and, and so it's interesting to me that you know, Peter has that conversation with Jesus about and you need to shepherd, you need to you know, tend to uh, my sheep, my lambs. And then Peter, at the end of his life, comes back to that point and says, all right, you, if you're going to be an elder, you need to shepherd the flock as well. And the rest of the stuff will sort of fall into place if you're willing to unconditionally love um, those who are in your care. So, and this makes me think, this, and that you reminded me, Keith, some wonderful Old Testament passages here are the texts in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, where the Lord, through his prophets, really hammers the shepherds of Israel mm-hmm. for not doing their jobs. They're not caring for the people and leading them in faithfulness to God. Instead, they are ignoring or neglecting them, or they're abusing them and taking advantage of them for their own gain, mm-hmm. right? And Uh, There's a lot that we can learn about what God expects of the shepherds of his people from those passages by, number one, what the Lord says those leaders of Israel weren't doing, what he expected them to do when they weren't doing, what they were doing and he condemned them for doing, and what the Lord says he will do, he either says, you know, I myself will do it, I will shepherd them, or he says, I'm going to raise up shepherds, or in the case of Jeremiah, the shepherd, right, to, to care for my people where you guys have fallen down on the job. And so there's a lot that we can learn from those passages about what God expects of his, of the shepherds of his people. The third role uh, that I have here is teacher. The elders should be able to instruct those under their care. Uh, And that could be, you know, evangelizing new believers, you know, about going out and helping people come to faith. Uh, or that can also be you know, teaching those who are already faithful, uh, seasoned believers. Um, but the idea of, of that, that teaching aspect or component, uh, and this is found in 1 Timothy 3 2, 1 Timothy 5 17, Titus 1 9, Ephesians 4 11, Acts 2 42, 1 Thessalonians 5 12, and 2 Timothy 4 1 and 2. Uh, the idea that the elder should be able to teach or should be a teacher of those who are under their care. Yeah. And this is also really, really important. First of all, I think it's, and you've alluded to this, it's important for us to understand that teaching can take many different forms, right? It's not always located in a classroom with a group of sit- students sitting in front of you, right? There, and uh, my point is there are many different ways that elders can fulfill this function, right? It could be as, as simple as a one-on-one mentoring relationship, right? or discipling relationship where an elder is working just with one other person and helping them grow in the Lord or work through a problem, right? It could be an evangelistic uh, activity where you're teaching the gospel to someone who doesn't yet follow Christ. Um, It can be in that formal setting that we often think of when we hear that word, right? Um, It can also be in the function of preaching. And and, and Paul refers to this, and I think it's that 1 Timothy 5 passage, right, Keith, where he refers to elders who, who preach and teach. Yeah. Uh, and so often we think of the preacher as the only one who should do the preaching, but I, I don't think that's the case, right? I do think that not all elders necessarily, but certainly there are some elders in, in local congregations who are capable of and therefore should preach, at least on occasion. Um, 
my 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 mentor in ministry, Larry Ferguson, uh, very believed very strongly in this, and he always arranged his preaching calendar such that there were opportunities in the year mm -hmm. for at least some of the elders to preach during the year. Um, I think that's an excellent thing. Uh, yeah, we did something similar at the church I was at in Ohio, uh, where you know periodically would take uh, some time to give. Not necessarily the elders specifically, but some of the various uh, men in the congregation in general have uh, the opportunity to take like a Sunday evening service or a Sunday morning service to uh, preach about something maybe that dealt with the topic at hand or you know, just kind of open ended, whatever they uh, felt led to, to talk about. And it was a, a worthwhile endeavor. I think it's good for the congregation uh, that they, again, they get a different perspective every once in a while. Um, you know, just as it's important for not only one person to make all the decisions, it's also important for the people to have more than one person giving them uh, their perspective or their interpretation or their ideas uh, of how to go about doing this thing we call Christianity. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah so that teaching role is really important. And the, part of the protecting role mm -hmm. uh, of the of the elders comes in here when we're in the teaching function we specifically think about protecting from false teachers and false doctrine right and it is that the elders do have this responsibility and paul gives this warning to the ephesian elders in acts 20 about the false teachers the wolves who will arise from among their own number and i don't know if he means from the from the number of the men sitting in front of him or if he means from the number you know from the members of the church right but Either way, he's warning, hey, false teachers are coming, and this is a consistent theme in so many of the New Testament documents, from the words of Jesus to the letters uh, in, the, in, in the church, or to the letters to the churches in the New Testament, to the book of Revelation, is consistent dealing with false teaching and false teachers, and how those who are entrusted with leadership uh, have this responsibility to be on, on guard against that, and educate church members so that they're able to recognize and resist false teaching. Uh, yeah, it's important. And I mean, realistically, when we look at all of these different roles of an elder, um, it's sort of all based upon what the role of a father would be in a family, uh, which I think should make a great deal of sense. And most of the church positions are based on the church family in the first place anyway. Um, but I mean, you take the role of leader. Well, you know, the father's role in Jewish families 2000 years ago um, was to make sure his family got where they needed to be, uh, that they uh, had their home, that the decisions that were made in that home were what was best for the wife, for the children, for everybody involved. Uh, the idea of a shepherd, you know, it's the father's job to make sure that his wife, his children are, are taken care of, are provided for, uh, that if they get injured, that their wounds are, are healed. Um, and the idea of teaching, you know, the father's job is to make sure that his children are raised in an environment where they learn, where they grow, where they know what they need to do uh, as they get older uh, so that they're able to function in society properly or uh, to disciple, especially if he has a, a son, to disciple uh, that son to take on uh, his role uh, as a father in the future, his role in the work environment, uh, whatever it is that he does for a living. And all of these are family roles that are then you know, expanded upon to say, well, the church is one giant family. And if you're going to be an elder, then you're going to be the father of this church family. Yeah, yeah. have a very fatherly, yeah, fatherly kind of role, for sure. So we've talked about leading shepherding teaching what's number four equipping equipping and, and here the elders should train those who will work or will be uh, a part of the next generation uh, that can be giving them uh, the tools that are needed to carry on the work of the church that can be uh, discipling them mentoring them so they're ready for their roles there's a lot of overlap here with teaching um, and this is found in ephesians chapter 4 and second timothy 2 2 uh, the idea of the elder being an equipper. Yeah. So this is this is an area where um, I'm still working on this, Keith, learning to do this well and have this focus as a as a 
preacher or minister. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a challenge for me, I can imagine that it is also a challenge for elders. It's this idea that it's not my job to do all the ministry so much as it is my job to equip others to do the work of ministry, right? That's what Ephesians says. Yeah. So um, it's not that it's not that as a preacher or a minister or an elder, we shouldn't do ministry, but part of the work of ministry is equipping others to do the work of ministry, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that takes a different level of intentionality. Uh, and, and, you know, many of us who are involved in leadership kind of have this, you know, mindset of getting things done. And as we, we, we develop certain competencies in getting things done, showing, out, so showing someone else how to get things done, how to do things, how to, how to lead takes time. Yes. Sometimes it can be frustrating. Uh, and sometimes we can just think, well, that's more of a headache than it's worth, right? It's so much quicker and easier if I just do it myself, right? But that's not the point. And I've had to learn this myself, often the hard way. It's not getting things done isn't the only point, right? That the point is helping others grow and develop and mature so that they can share in that that work of, of faithfulness and fruitfulness for the kingdom. Yeah. And I think you know if we if we use that family analogy. Uh, this idea becomes easier to understand. Um, so, you know, let's use the father and son role again and say, you have a flat tire. Well, it's far easier if you're the father in the scenario to just go and change that flat tire yourself and um, get it done quickly, efficiently. Uh, it's all taken care of and you're ready to get on the road again. Um, but if you want to equip your son to be able to handle that scenario in the future, you right. take with you, you take twice as long so that you can go through all the steps slowly and carefully and show them what to do, maybe give them a chance to try it out himself. Um, but you're, you're training him to be able to do that after you are gone. Exactly right. The, the, the quote that always sticks out in my mind for this conversation comes from Lloyd Pelfrey. He was one of my professors at Central. He's written a number of the lessons for the standard um, lesson series and stuff like that. And he used to say uh, that in the church, we are always only one generation away from apostasy, from yeah. Yeah. the church ending. Uh, and so it, it's up to this generation to train the next generation, or else there won't be a next generation. Next generation, yeah. It's an excellent point. And, and I think equipping is very much a part of that. And I, I struggle with this, too, because in all honesty, it's a lot easier to just uh, this needs to get done. I'll do it myself. It'll take me five minutes uh, and we're good to go. Uh, right. But we all have to, if we're in leadership, uh, be that a pastor, be that an elder, be that a deacon, be that a Sunday school teacher, be that whoever. Uh, if you're in a, a leadership role, you know, one of your jobs is to train the people who are going to come after you because uh, none of us is going to be around forever. Uh, and, and I do think this is one of the, this is a side scene. So I'm just going to make this comment and then we can move on. But this whole point, this whole idea of equipping people to do the work of ministry is one of the keys to church health and growth. Mm -hmm. I think that's why Paul focuses on it in Ephesians 4, right? Um, you know, when I was preaching through Ephesians earlier this year, a statement I, I used out of my study of that passage was that the body of Christ grows through every member ministry, because that's what Paul is, at, Paul is after in Ephesians 4 grows spiritually, grows numerically, grows in health and depth, uh, yeah, in unity. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't have my li the list in front of us, Keith. What do we have left to cover? So we've talked about what is an elder. We've talked about what an elder should do. Uh, the final point for this episode is how do we determine who should be an elder, uh, which is going to be a messy conversation because it is a messy conversation practice uh, in our day and age. Uh, so as before, um, caveat here, what, what we think we are describing at, when we answer this question of how do we determine who should be an elder, um, colors how we make this determination. Uh, and it's worth noting that um, while we are given lists of qualifications, uh, there are a variety of ideas of what to do with them. Um, what we talked about earlier, are these things descriptive uh, of, of what happened or things like that, or are they prescriptive? Uh, that this is the way it should be done, or this is uh, what specifically to look for. Um, and so you know, the way we answer the first two questions and just 
the way we think about this topic in general it is going to have a very large impact on this. Uh, our hermeneutic, our approach to interpretation is going to affect uh, how we answer this question of who, how do we determine who should be an elder? There, I, I, take these, I take the passages, especially in Timothy and Titus, to be prescriptive in nature, right? Where Paul is saying, um, this is what an elder slash overseer should look like. Mm -hmm. These are the, and they're largely character descriptions. Yes. You know, they're not, aside from a point or two, they're not so much ability or skill uh, descriptions as they are. This is the kind of person who should have this responsibility. Right. Yeah. And so I do think that there is some room for discussion as in, you know, does every single person who's an elder have to get an A plus in every one of these areas before they qualify, right? Because most of us are going to be disqualified if that's the case. I, I do think there's some room for discussion to how we apply them, but I, I do think they are prescriptive in nature. Yeah. And some of them, again, it, it's hard to know for sure how to interpret them. Uh, one of the big ones is that the elder should be the husband of one wife. You know, yeah, what does that phrase that, mean? Yeah. And does that mean that the husband, the, the, the elder one has to be married? You know, if he's single, does that eliminate him from being an elder? Um, does that mean if he's been widowed, uh, does that disqualify him? Does that mean if he's been divorced, does that disqualify him? Um, does that mean if he's been divorced, but he doesn't remarry, is that okay? Versus if he is divorced and he remarries, or if he's widowed and he remarries. And I know of a church that you know, they had an elder who, I mean, he was an excellent elder. He served faithfully for a very long time. And then his wife passed away and they said, well, He's no longer the husband of one wife, so he's disqualified. He can't be an elder anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I know a gentleman who interpreted that dogmatically interpreted that to mean the elder must be married. Mm -hmm. And I tried to explain that if, if that's what Paul wanted to say, he had vocabulary available to him to say that. Right. And he didn't use that vocabulary. That's not his point. But it is, it is difficult to interpret, and there are a lot of questions, as you said, Keith. And there are a couple of other of the descriptions that, that are open to, to question and interpretation like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the, point is, the point is, while I do think overall we can be clear about what these qualifications mean, there's, you know, a, a dogmatic approach to them is not helpful. Right. Yeah. Um, so there are two major passages and we've referenced them several times already uh, that give these qualifications that would be first timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 and titus chapter 1 verses 5 through 9 uh, for elders uh, and then the timothy passage goes on and talks about deacons as well um, and i'm going to follow dr stevens again on this because i really like the way he lays this out uh, he takes all of the words that are listed as qualifications in those passages and groups them into four areas of life um, as or as you know this is what you should look for in, in these specific areas and the first of them that he groups as the the qualifications for the personal life uh, and here he says he puts um, that the elders should be above reproach uh, should be temperate should be prudent should be sensible and self-controlled, should not be addicted to much wine, should be free from the love of money, should not be quick-tempered, should love what is good. And he says, in his personal life, the elder is a man who can control himself and who can do what is best for those around him. Though he's not perfect, he has a good handle on his sinful desires and temptations. I, I think that's excellent. I think that's an excellent summary of what those particular character qualifications are about and i think you know when we look through these things um, again the idea is not that we are sinless perfect because not a single one of us is in the first place um, but the, the question of do you have a handle on, on what's going on in your life are you able to rein in your emotions, your temptations, your desires, and, and you know, are you actively putting to death 
and to those things which are, are bad, which are taking you away from faith in order to promote the good in both yourself and in those around you. And this, I mean, this so directly relates to the role of the elder mm -hmm. to be an example of Christ to the flock, right? You cannot be a, an example of Christ to the flock if you are out of control yourself, right? If, if you don't have a handle on your emotions, your vulnerabilities, your temptations, your sins, if you've not made some progress in submitting yourself to the work of the Holy Spirit as he works to bring about self-control and the other fruits mm -hmm. within you, right? If you've not made some progress toward emotional health and maturity, you know, if you've not just spent some time as, a, as an apprentice of Jesus and, and learned a good deal about what it means to, to follow him and put his teachings into practice, again, not perfection, but but progress and maturity, right? You just you just cannot be an example of the flock if if those things are not true, right? Yeah, and so when we talk about you know who should be an elder or who should not be an elder in the congregation, uh, some of those warning signs would be whether or not that individual uh, is capable uh, of keeping himself under control or if he's you know always on edge, always doing things he shouldn't be doing or you know, lashing out at people, um, whether he is continuing to make progress or um, ha has started to backslide. Um, all of those things need to be taken into consideration. Um, yeah. So this is an area, this is an area where again, so sometimes one of the mistakes that has been made is we take a person who is good in leadership in the business world mm -hmm. and we put that person uh, into eldership within the church and that person may be good in leadership in the business world but in his but he doesn't have control over his emotions his impulses his behaviors himself and he can be successful in the business world because um, you can run roughshod over people and still get a lot done and make a lot of money right um, whereas in the church, you cannot run roughshod over people and represent Jesus well, right? Uh, and, and serve him well, because that's not how, who he is or how he treats people. So this is an area where we get into, get into trouble if we think that good leadership in the world necessarily equals good leadership in the church. It just doesn't, right? And um, because Christian leadership is so much more focused on on, on character and on love and not on productivity. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we pay attention to this, what a person is like in his personal life and does he have a handle on these things and is he making progress in spiritual and emotional maturity? Um, we, we pay attention to these things because, uh, you know, without them, we end up misrepresenting Christ and doing damage to his to his church. Yeah. And again, you know, the model that we use for church leadership is going to have a big impact on um, this conversation. Uh, if your, your church is set up as a business uh, mm -hmm. where there's sort of a one-to-one -one ratio of the business world and the church world, then that idea makes perfect sense. You want people that are good in the business world uh, to be leading your church. I don't see that as being the model given in the New Testament. So mm -hmm. I'm not at all convinced that that is the model we should use uh, mm -hmm. in, in church leadership. Um, again, the model I see is that of a family. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, when we're looking at leadership, you know, that idea of you know, how they handle their personal life, how they handle their family life, which is the second category, um, is far more important um, than whether or not they're good at making money or, or running a business. But the model we use and the model we have set up in our church is going to have a big impact on what kinds of leaders we look at. Yeah. So the second category, as I said, is family life. Uh, and here Dr. Stevens puts uh, from 1 Timothy and Titus uh, that the elder should be the husband of one wife, should have children who behave in a disciplined manner, children who believe, uh, be a good manager of his own household. Uh, 
Paul asks the question, if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Um, and then says, in his family life, the elders should have a history of leading, teaching, shepherding, and equipping. Some of those things we talked about in question two. Uh, as a demonstration that he can be faithful with a few things and has himself been equipped for the role for many things. Yeah. So this this also, and Keith has referred several times to the, you know, kind of the analogy or relationship between family and church. Um, this is an area where, you know, we can over interpret a little bit. None of these qualifications mean that an elder or pastor can't have problems in his family. It doesn't mean that he has to be perfect, that his wife has to be perfect, that his children have to be perfect. It, none of, it doesn't mean that, right? That, that, that would be unrealistic. None of us obtain that. None of us obtain that standard. Um, and so, but the, the, again, the point is this, is, is, is the elder a Christ-like leader in his home? And does he have a handle on the care of and leadership of his family? Or are things out of control and a mess and a disaster, right? Because if they're out of control and a mess and a disaster, uh, you know, that, 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 that person needs to get those things, he needs to focus on that mm -hmm. rather than focus on trying to lead God's church, right? Um, and, and he can't, you know, the, the principle is he can't lead God's church well if he can't lead his own family well, right? Um, so again, it's not saying that, that there's an expectation of perfection or there can't be problems or, you know, if the elder's kid is the one running up and down the aisle and, and you know, after church, running around the sanctuary, you know, that doesn't automatically disqualify him from eldership, right? Kids will be kids, right? Um, and, and sometimes harm has been done to the families of elders and pastors by this kind of unrealistic standard for their families. Um, and I don't think that's what Paul is, is advocating here, but rather, you know, again, is this person a Christ-like leader and does, does he have a handle on things, right, in, in caring for and loving and serving his family? And I think the emphasis here is not on the actions or the attitudes or anything relating to the family itself. Like we're not facing whether or not a person can be an elder on how his, his children or his wife behave, act, think, feel, do, whatever. Yeah. The, the, the qualification is how the elder treats Yes, those individuals. Is he faithful to his wife? Has he, you know, done what he needs to do to help raise his children in a loving Christian manner? You know, is he doing what he's supposed to be doing towards his family? Uh, and then using right. that, all right, if he can do that with his family, even though his family is not perfect, even though they're going to make mistakes, even if they do something radically stupid, um, right. if he has a history of being faithful and Christian towards his family, then he's likely to also do so with the church. The don't, appoint, on, oh. don't appoint a promiscuous man, an abusive man, yeah. an absent man. He's an absentee as a father or a husband. Don't appoint a man like that, yeah. right, in, into the leadership of the church. Yeah. 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 Don't yeah. appoint a man who, who is successful in some ways, but who who takes no interest in in the spiritual welfare of his family, right? Don't appoint that man as a leadership as a leader in God's church. Right? Yeah, but yeah. The emphasis is on how he treats others, not on the ramifications or the actions of those others. And I think that's yeah. where we, we have gotten messed up uh, a time or right. two in the church. Right. So personal life, family life. The third category is public life. Uh, and here, Dr. Stevens puts the qualifications of the elders to be respectable, peaceable, gentle, not pugnacious, not self-willed, just hospitable, should have a good reputation with those outside the church. Uh, so the elder should be consistent in his life, that who he is on Sunday at the church is also who he is on Monday at work at home and in the community. And in addition, who he is is a person who promotes peace and a virtuous Christ-like life. Yeah. 
And this is very similar to what we said with the other two categories as well. Um, that idea of consistency, of faithfulness, of you know, the way the that individual handles situations, handles people, treats others. Um, and so, you know, some of these things, again, are easy to misinterpret. Uh, so, you know, having a good reputation outside the church. Well, what if somebody doesn't like him? Or what if somebody, you know, uh, has made a false accusation against him? Or, you know, well, that's, that's not the, the issue here. The issue is, you know, how does he handle his affairs outside of the church? How does he, you know, deal with those situations when they come up? Yeah. Is he a gentle peaceable just person in his interactions with unbelievers right how is he thought of in community right mm -hmm. um such that if we appoint this person as an elder right is that person immediately going to create reputational problems for the church because in the community he's known to be angry mm -hmm. or he's known to cut corners in his business dealings or he's known to you know, be prejudiced or whatever, right? Um, you know, if he if he has if he's known to be these ways, if he behaves these ways in public, right? He, he's going to bring the church into disrepute. You know, if he's a if he, you know if he's a leader of the church, you know. And then the final category is in congregational life. The elders should not be a new convert; should be devout should be able to teach, should be able to exhort sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it, should be above reproach as God's steward. In the church, the elder is someone who has a long history of being dedicated to God's word and God's people. And becoming an elder should be more about recognizing who's already leading this way mm -hmm. uh, than promoting somebody into a position. Yeah, yeah, so much, so, so much of this, in all four of these areas is about track record is a key. It's just about track record, you know, and this, this idea of faithfulness exhibited over time and growth exhibited over time, yeah. right? And so often the people who are right for these roles are the people who do the works of these roles because they want to they don't even have to be asked to do so. They may well be volunteering to do so. They just take it upon themselves to do so because they love Jesus and they love his people and they love the mission of the church, right? And that's, those are the raw ingredients that you're looking for, right? And that, uh, that Keith and I want to see in ourselves, right? Those are the kind of people we want to be, right? Um, yeah, and so, and so when you see a lot of that already occurring in someone, and then you can say, aha, right? You know, this is someone in whom the Holy Spirit is working. This is someone who's growing in Christ and, mm -hmm. and, and has demonstrated this over a period of time, right? It's interesting to think about Paul going back and appointing church, appointing elders in the churches he established. How much time lapsed between the establishment of the churches and the appointment of the elders? Right. Were those people who were appointed as elders already well respected within the communities that they that they were a part of maybe they were leaders in synagogues maybe they were um just leaders in their communities and they were already well known and, and for a lot of these character traits that we've discussed right um you know, maybe they already you know had some standing in in judaism and and Therefore, their growth in Christ had a solid foundation to begin with. You know, it's interesting to think about that. We don't really know how much time lapsed between the establishment of the churches and the appointment of elders. Right. But, yeah. And in addition to that, how much of that, again, is descriptive versus prescriptive? You know, if it right. took a year, if it took two years between the foundation of a congregation in Galatia or Ephesus or Crete or whatnot, uh, before they appointed elders, is that the same length of time that we wait on, or do we use a, a different time frame? Right. Yeah. There. There's no, yes, that's very true. That's, we can't look to those examples for like, this is exactly how we should, what it, what timeline we should use, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Much more, it, much more than any arbitrary timeline, much more important is, 
are these qualities present in this person's life? Right. Have they demonstrated it? Right. And I think if we're being honest, most of these, as difficult as it can be uh, at times to know specifically what to do with this stuff, uh, the vast majority of this is fairly easy to understand and mm -hmm. fairly easy to see. Mm -hmm. uh, I may not know every specific detail, um, but if I am part of a congregation and I am considering whether or not somebody should be an elder and I have a relationship with that person already, I've been going to church with them for a while, I've seen them outside the church, I probably have a fairly firm grasp of whether or not that individual meets most all of these qualifications. And I can tell if you know, he has a good reputation outside of the church or not, or if he is peaceable and loving or not, or if he's a new convert, or if he's able to teach, or you know, all of these things. It's pretty easy to observe if you yeah. spend time with the person. Yeah, that's the key, spending time with and knowing. Okay. So I think, I think Keith, this episode is going to set a record for a length of time, uh, which is okay. Yeah. We hope that we hope that this this conversation has been beneficial and that you're uh, you've hung in there with us. Um, so where are we going to go in our next episode? So the next episode we're going to sort of pick up where we left off, but ask some more open-ended questions. Uh, today has mostly just been about defining elders and, and what they do. Um, next time we're going to talk about you know how do we actually go about the the specifics of putting a person into the role of elder and do we elect them do we appoint them do we promote them and um, we'll talk about uh, how many they sh churches should have we'll talk about some of the controversial questions can a woman be an elder can a divorced person be an elder all that things can elders make decisions without congregational input what are some of the the things just the general good practices that elders should do or the things that elders should not do uh, we'll base some of this upon our experiences in ministry, working with elders, uh, of things we have seen that go well, things that we have seen that do not go well, um, talk about how you remove an elder who's not qualified, all that fun, more controversial stuff uh, will be in, in the second half of, of this conversation. So the next episode, um, all of that to look forward to. Great. That sounds great to me, Keith. I've enjoyed this conversation. I have as well. It's good to, to be back on this again uh, yep. and to be able to, to work with you again. I look forward to joining you in the future. And if you're watching at home, we're looking forward to having you guys join us in the future as well. Uh, sort of a mini announcement since I haven't really done this anywhere else yet. Uh, all of the previous episodes of the Small Town Pastors blog, in addition to being on Facebook, are now on a dedicated YouTube page. So if you go to YouTube, you search Small Town Pastors blog, uh, all of our previous episodes will be there to watch at your leisure. And then any future episodes will be uploaded there in addition to Facebook. So uh, we encourage you to share this uh, with uh, others you know, especially those that are in this conversation of church leadership, elders, pastors, deacons, other church leaders, um, that they could really benefit from, from being a part. Yeah. Uh, and just to clarify, it's small town pastors vlog, yes. right? V yes. for video log, not blog. Yes. Uh, so when you go to YouTube, it's small town pastors vlog, V L O G. Yes. Yep. Check us out and share it. And uh, yeah. Thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you again next time.